Anyone who's ever worked toward a diploma or a certification of some kind or a degree has been acquainted with requirements and electives, right? The requirements are what they give you in order to fulfill the degree or whatever it is that you're trying to do. What is it about a requirement that, uh, can you say, I, I would rather not? Bill and I went to seminary. We were required to take Hebrew Bible, New Testament. I was required to take preaching. I think you were too, probably. What if I had said, you know, I think I'd rather skip that preaching class? No way. No way. You got to take the class if you want to get the credits. Now, so you look at the requirements and you go there. And oh, by the way, I was an English major in college. So the requirement for one math course and one science course, I took teaching math to preschoolers, teaching arithmetic to preschoolers, only time I ever got an A, and I took physics of light and color, which helped me with photography and also told me the best time of day to get a suntan. <laughs> Those courses were also known as math and English, math and science for English majors. But when you get to the class, what do they give you the first day? The syllabus. What's the syllabus for? So you can tell when to sleep in, did someone say? <laughs> I can't tell you the number of times as a pastor I have had a frantic call from a freshman in college saying, <laughs> I'm going to flunk out because they didn't tell me that I had a test. They didn't remind. I said, did you get a syllabus? Yeah, but I don't know what I did with it. They're supposed to remind me when I have a test or a paper due. I'm going to tell you the advice I gave a young man. I said, you're going to listen to me. You're going to go to your professor, you're going to get on your knees, and you're going to grovel, and you're going to cry like a baby until you say, I have sinned before God and before you, and I need another chance. And he did, and he graduated. <laughs> the syllabus gives you the outline of what it is that's coming that semester, what you're going to learn, how you're going to learn it, what your expectations are. So today we have both the list of requirements and we have the syllabus, the list of requirements being God's word given to the prophet Micah. If you know nothing else about the prophet Micah, you know the passage that says, what does the Lord require of you? Let me ask you, what does the Lord require of you? To seek justice, to love mercy or kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. Those are the requirements. But you have to look at that in context. Because we have this weird little passage that talks about what is it that God is asking. And God is saying he has a controversy with his people. A controversy meaning the grand jury has been called and your behind is on trial. And God says, what have I done to you people? What have I done to you that you would turn against me this way? And then God goes, I know, I saved you from slavery in Egypt. God's being a little sarcastic here if you didn't catch that tone. And then God's saying to the prophet, what is it that I am expecting from my people? What is it that I'm requiring from my people? Am I asking them to give a calf a year old? We read that and we think, well, you know, that's the days of sacrifice. A calf a year old, that's like us saying, what am I supposed to put in the offering plate, Lord? A year's salary? Gross? Then it gets up a little bit more. Shall I come before the Lord with herds of 10,000? Not even a king would have that many head of livestock to offer. It goes a little crazier then. Rivers of oil. No one could create that other than God himself could make rivers of oil flow. Olive oil, the sign of gladness and the sign of favor. And then the question, am I supposed to give my firstborn child? Which is really a stinging indictment of the kings of Israel who did what was evil in God's sight because they actually sacrificed their own children instead of the animals. God says, is this what I'm asking from you? No. What I'm requiring is that you love one another, that you love kindness and mercy, that you walk humbly before me. Humbly not meaning with your head bowed down in a position of deference, but meaning that you're intentionally walking with God and that in your life you are doing justice to each other, that you're living rightly before me by living rightly with one another. 
So if that's the set of requirements for this degree called Christianity and Discipleship, then we get the syllabus. And we're going to read the next few weeks through the Sermon on the Mount. And again, we have to set that in the context. It says that Jesus saw the crowds and he went up on the mountain. He took his disciples with him because remember, he's just called them away from their old lives, tax collectors and fishermen, simple people, everyday folk. And he's sitting them down to explain to them the syllabus of what he is going to be teaching them. This is Christianity and Discipleship 101. But there's a crowd there. And we don't see who this crowd is unless you go back to chapter 4. And you see that these are the people that Jesus has healed and touched and comforted and brought hope to. They have flocked to him because they're desperate, they're poor, they're sick. They have spirits that they can't understand. They're hungry and thirsty. They're beaten down by the world. And so he stops and he teaches them that these things are blessings. Doesn't make much sense, does it? How do we use the word blessing? We say, oh, God bless you when you sneeze, which goes back to the days when you thought someone's soul would come out their nose if they sneeze. So you say, God bless you, sort of to plug it back in. <laughs> or if you're from the South, and I just served an appointment in West Virginia, when you say, bless her heart. <laughs> Linda, does that mean we're asking something good to happen to her? Depends. It depends. <laughs> She's such a pill, bless her heart. <laughs> but here, blessing is not the Old Testament concept of a blessing, something that is conferred. And sometimes it's translated as happy, and happy really misses the mark. Robert Schuller wrote a book called The Be Happy Attitudes. Nah, that's not right either. What this word means in the Greek is something that's hard to translate into one exact English word. It means, aren't you lucky? Aren't you envied when these things happen to you? So I've written a little bit different version of the Beatitudes in a more modern form of English with a little fuller understanding of the words. I'm going to read that to you now. How fortunate are you, Jesus says, how enviable when you hit the wall and come to understand that the only thing you can truly rely upon is God. This is why I have come to you. How fortunate you are, how enviable, when your heart is aching with grief. God has heard your anguished cries and has sent me to comfort you. How fortunate you are, how enviable, when you are devalued by others because you value kindness above power or success. Look around you. All this will be yours one day because I have come to turn things around. How fortunate are you, how enviable, when you seek God's will in all things. I have come to give you what you seek. How fortunate you are, how enviable, when you forgive others from your heart. You are the ones who really get it. I have come to forgive you. How fortunate you are, how enviable, when you refuse to let the world corrupt you, when your heart belongs to God alone, you will see God's face to face. That is why I have come to you. How fortunate you are, how enviable, when you work for wholeness among people, when you love others wholly, especially those who have hurt you, the ones others call your enemy, welcome to the family of God. How fortunate are you, how enviable, when people grind you into the dirt because of your faith, not because it pleases God to see you suffer, but because God has sent me to shepherd you through the darkest valley. Heaven will be yours, I promise. How fortunate are you, how enviable, when others try to ruin your reputation, when they talk about you like you're a dog, when they spit in your face because you have decided to follow me. Smile, you're in good company. And this is exactly why the Father has sent me to you. And I am going to take you to heaven with me. These are promises not for a pie in the sky life in heaven, but for a change in the reality here that brings us to heaven because God in Christ is going to bring heaven to earth again when he comes to claim us as his own. But until then, this is the syllabus for how we're to live with each other. And it doesn't always make sense, does it? To feel blessed, to feel fortunate or lucky or graced by God when things don't seem to be going your way, when you're persecuted, when you're grieving, when you're struggling. 
that's when it's good to look at the letter that Paul wrote to the Corinthian church. The foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom. God who sent Jesus, we just got through the Christmas season, a little tiny baby boy born in a barn. He has overcome the power of sin and death. No one thought that was how he was going to come. And now we're in a church where people are fighting with each other. The Corinthian church, much like 21st century United Methodism, where people are saying, no, I have the full truth. No, I have the full truth. You can't be right because I'm right. If you're right, that makes me wrong, and I can't be wrong because I'm right. They're valuing their gifts as more powerful and wonderful and more God closer to them than the others. And Paul writes to them and says, what you think you know is nothing compared to what God does and what God can do. And the foolishness that he's talking about is a crucified God. Did you know that decent people didn't use the word cross in the time of our Lord and Savior? Decent people wouldn't use it because it was a foul word. It was a dirty word. It was a common term. And nice people didn't use words like that. But it was by the cross, the execution method kept for the lowest of the low, that God has overcome the power of sin and death and raised us to new life with Jesus. One thing that I have not been able to find in my new house is my crucifix. I have a crucifix that hangs over my bedroom door. It was given to me by a couple that I married years ago, and it is one of those little, it was a couple without any money or any brains, and I hope to God they're still married because I had my doubts. They were young, and I've prayed for them for years. But the gift they gave me for doing their wedding was a crucifix, one of those little $2 crucifixes that you get in a Catholic gift shop. And for a while it sat in the box. And then one day I thought, no, I'm going to hang it up in my house. And I hung it over my bedroom door. And immediately someone who came to my house looked at it and said, that's Catholic. I said, no, that's Jesus. And the person who was there went on to say, I worship a risen God. I said, so do I. But one who went to the cross for my sin. You know why it hangs over my bedroom door? Because it's the first thing I see every morning when I open my eyes. And when I go in and out, I pass under it every day. And I look up and I think, because I can be a whiner sometimes. Just ask my mom and dad. I can be a whiner. Nothing will happen to me in that day that is anything like what God endured for my sake. And because of those things, believe you me, I know I am blessed. I am blessed. I am fortunate. I am enviable because the kingdom of heaven is mine, not because of what I've done, mostly in spite of what I've left undone, but because of the grace of God poured into me through Jesus Christ, my Savior. So what is God going to require of us? Not, it's not an elective. It's not what we can choose to do. God is going to require us to live justly with one another because that's what the kingdom is about. God wants us to love mercy and kindness. God wants us to be able to put ourselves in someone else's shoes and see what they're going through and empathize with them and share lives with them and forgive when we think we cannot. And God wants us to walk humbly, meaning intentionally, with all of our hearts, walk with God. Maybe it's not easy to be a Christian. I don't know. But I can tell you what. When you get to the end of your journey, you will find not just heaven in the future, but that your life was heaven here because you chose to live in the kingdom. And because of that, you have been very, very blessed. Amen.